Bienvenidas y bienvenidos de nuevo a Canal Economic Zones, aquí en Casa SEAT. Ayer aquí hablábamos en un panel llamado Be Open de la necesaria cooperación entre países para un desarrollo sostenible. Hoy, en el panel Be Association, hacia una mayor cooperación entre zonas económicas. Para este diálogo híbrido de nuevo, porque tenemos conectados a, a varios eh, participantes, Vamos con Eric Autor desde Washington. Good afternoon, Eric. Hello. Hello. Good morning from here in Washington. Good morning. Ahmed Beniz desde Marruecos. Hello again, Ahmed. Hola. Hola. Vamos bien. Muy bien, muy bien. Y Gracias. Gustavo González desde Tenerife. Hola de nuevo, Gustavo. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo está? Muy bien. Encantado de estamos. participar una vez más. Un placer para nosotros también. Y contamos con la moderación de Jorge Alberto Díaz Rivera, International Project Manager, responsable de contenido de este canal, y mi jefe. Aquí lo tenemos, a mi Vera. Hola, Jorge. Uy, Hola, Ana. Me pongo nerviosa y todo. <risa> Muchas gracias, Ana. Moderarás bien, ¿eh? Esperamos Espero que sí. Espero mucho de ti, ¿eh? Así será. Cero presión, ¿eh? Cero presión. Todo tuyo, adelante. Marhaba, welcome. Bienvenidos. Dobra Payalovich. It's a pleasure to have this panel today, and especially these panelists with us. I'm very happy and proud to be here with you. Uh, we have among us Mr. Ahmed Benis. He is the Secretary General of the African Economic Zone Organization. He's a graduate of business and economics from Heck University in Paris. Welcome, Ahmed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jorge. We also have among us uh, Mr. Eric Otter. He is the president of the North American Free Trade Zone Association. He's a graduate in business and government from Duke University and London School of Economics. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, the president of the ASFA, who is the Latin American Free Zone Association, Mr. Gustavo Gonzalez de Vega, who is a, a graduate in law from the University Mendes, Menendez Pelayo in Spain. Welcome, Gustavo. Thank you, Jorge. Well, um, it's been uh, a very interesting debate so far, and now we're going to focus a little bit more uh, on the regional aspects. How has COVID uh, impacted the free zones and the associations in the region? So I'm going to start with Ahmed, and I would like to ask Ahmed, how does the African free zones have reacted to this pandemia? That we are living currently today. Uh, thank you, Jorge. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization team for uh, inviting us to attend this uh, wonderful uh, event. And uh, of course, I wanted to, to extend my thanks to the organization team of the BNU and also the panelists. Um, so uh, I'm the Secretary General of the Africa Economic Zones Organizations and also the Group Business Development uh, Directors of uh, Tanger Med, which is one of the largest economic zones in the African continent. Um, let me start by sharing some insights uh, on the development of the economic zones in the continent. So uh, our organization is the representative of this economic zones uh, community. We gather more than 80 members representing 45 uh, African countries. And as of today, uh, more than 189 uh, economic zones has been developed, have been developed in the continent, and uh, 57 projects have been announced for completions. But uh, since its inception, the African special economic zones have given a significant boost uh, to attract uh, FDI and to create an attractive investment conditions supporting uh, job creations. Over the last five years, uh, more than 60 million jobs have been created in several activity sector, our group processing, industrial fields, and services. Um, the African economic zones are also facing an uncertain period as uh, COVID-19 uh, disrupts their activities and hinder their operations due to lockdown restrictions. Most of them are reliant on manufacturing and export-led activities. So business continuity plan has been Im implemented uh, in order to support the industrial operations, getting product to market, and granting access to uh, raw material. And the business continuity plan consists on a series of security and safety uh, measures 
uh, that aims to preserve the security and safety of employees while meeting the demand of the economic zones operators. So uh, the economic zones managers have implemented together with the industrialists the major recommendation of uh, the World Health Organizations. So there were a task for a committee that has been set, of course, social distancing, uh, uh, body temperatures, uh, um, disinfection of road and building. But uh, what was significant is, uh, let's say, the digitizations of uh, several operations, uh, including invoicing payments, the one-stop services that has been 100% uh, digitized. And um, this also uh, was developed uh, in parallel with the large awareness raising campaign and, of course, training sessions that has been uh, provided to uh, the economic zones operators. But the crisis uh, may also be considered as an opportunity to reconsider the regional value chain and the industrial integration uh, involving the economic zones, I mean, the African economic zones as the driver to implement innovative uh, sol uh, uh, soli uh, so solutions and innovative, innovative uh, policies. So the, the global pandemic has put the, has put the diversification of the global value chain at a, uh, at a center stage. Uh, and the economic zones uh, is the major stakeholders to, in, uh, to implement those, uh, those policies. Though the new wave of the global supply chain will definitely provide new opportunity to expand into new fields of activities and lead to new stimulus through attracting new investments and improving the, 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 the market demand. So it, 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 in that sense, we are entitled to develop new processes of the supply chain, supporting the vision of creating one African market under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is, uh, let's say, under implementation today. And this stands for making a significant contribution to reduce trade transactions and facilitate uh, cross-border cross -border trade. This uh, would definitely uh, boost the intra-African trade, enhance the Africa's global trade performance, and support regional and continental value chain by contributing to, to the expansion and diversification of the, the, the continent's productive uh, capacity. So we believe within our organization, I mean uh, African Economic Zones organization, we believe that uh, our community could spread the move to restore the economic activity in the wake of the COVID-19 based on value chain diversification, regional integration, and of course, investments and traction. It's, it's very interesting how you say that uh, the economic zones are actually acting like a force to unify Africa and African economy. And I would like to pass uh, now to Mr. Eric Otter. Um, the, uh, there are some key differences on how the economic zones work in the U.S. And I would like to continue this line of questioning. How, if you could please explain to us the difference of these economic zones and at the same time tell us how they were affected by this pandemic. Sure, thank you, Jorge, and, uh, and I'd like to extend my thanks also for being able to participate on this panel. Um, uh, it's really a great opportunity, and, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to have uh, a chance to chat uh, about the, the U.S. Zones program, some of the challenges we're facing, not only from COVID, from, but from other things as well. Um, so the the uh, the FTC program, which uh, as some of you probably know, is called the Foreign Trade Zone Program in the United States, uh, as opposed to Free Trade Zones in other countries. But it's essentially the same sort of system. It's one of the oldest in the world. It was created in 1934, so it's been in existence for quite a long time. We have over 700 active zones and subzones in all 50 states. Um, in the U.S. and Puerto Rico, um, and uh, we we are principally a duty program. In other words, the main benefits of the U.S. FTZ program are focused on on uh, uh, duty reduction, uh, duty elimination, and and uh, and de deferral and payment of duties. So it's 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 very much of a a duty structured program that doesn't have some of the tax benefits that a lot of other uh, FTC programs in other countries do. Um, uh, it is also one big difference is that 
while zones zones are considered in the united states outside of the customs territory of the u s but they are for all other purposes all other legal purposes in the united states jurisdiction so what that really means is that while the customs rules apply differently inside a foreign trade zone as opposed to outside one all other rules and regulations of the united states and the and the and the individual states and and municipalities do apply within the zones so and 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 the zone system over the years has built a very strong environment of compliance and and they take compliance and and the enforcement very seriously and working with the agencies the u.s agencies that regulate the u.s zone system which is the u.s commerce department which houses the foreign trade zone board and of course u.s customs and border protection so uh the 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 zones uh when you look at the industries that uh that operate inside uh the zones they're they're really a a quite quite varied uh group of industries uh including pharmaceuticals vehicles and vehicle parts electronics oil and petroleum petrochemicals textiles and apparel um operators um are both uh manufacturers and distributors uh some do a combination of both uh the zones employ over 440,000 people directly in over 3,300 zone facilities uh the ftc program also is a significant contributor to the economy of the United States, over 11% of all imports into the U.S. go into foreign trade zones, and nearly 7% of all U.S. exports come from U.S. Uh, foreign trade zones. So um, that's just a quick overview of the program and, and some of the some of the differences um, in our program as 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 opposed to how uh, zones operate in other countries. Uh, turning to the question of, of of the COVID pandemic and and the response and impact on the U.S. zones, you know, I think as a general statement that the U.S. has managed the whole COVID situation very poorly. Uh, there has not been a coordinated federal effort uh, really to speak of. Uh, President Trump essentially handed the responsibilities over to the states uh, that resulted in a in a very uncoordinated um, effort to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and that has had a general impact uh, throughout the country. You know, we, we lead the world in the number of infections and deaths. I was just telling Ahmed and, and Gustavo that we had uh, 50,000 uh, uh, new cases just yesterday in the United States. We are now over um, over seven and a half million in, uh, uh, cases since the pandemic started, and um, over two hundred and ten thousand deaths. So that I think is a really uh, indicative of uh, of the impact that it's had on the United States. Uh, for zones, when we look back at when the pandemic really first hit last spring, uh, we saw a, just a, a drop off the cliff in in in, in uh, economic activity, uh, production essentially ground to a halt, and uh, and many people were uh, laid off or furloughed. Um, you know, we still have a very high unemployment rate as a result of COVID. So um, I'll just take example of the auto auto sector, which is a very significant part of the zones program. Um, auto production essentially ceased um, and, th and that had a really uh, 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 severe impact obviously on, on that sector and the jobs and the, and the companies, but they weren't the only ones. They were just a, a, a good example. Things started to revive um, after May over the summer, but then we've been seeing since August a real uptick in, in cases and infections and, and so forth which uh, we're concerned is going to start slowing the economy down again. Now, with the zones, it's interesting that we have both a problem of, of, well, there's fundamentally a challenge in dealing with supply chains because in the spring, as things were slowing down in the United States, it was starting to pick up again in China. And we realized that there were some severe 
supply chain bottlenecks that were being created as a result as, as goods from Asia were coming into the ports but had nowhere to go uh, because uh, our transportation system was adversely impacted. Um, people were not uh, buying anything. The uh, production had, had shut down. So we were having a buildup of inventory. And we realized that the zones in the U.S. could provide a, a temporary solution by serving as an entrepot where goods could be stored temporarily, not assess duties, and then withdrawn when needed, when things started to pick up again. So we initiated this, uh, this uh, effort to uh, 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 provide information on available storage space in zones throughout the country. Uh, it was really a, a, a very um, well-received program that we put together sort of very quickly. Um, at the same time, we've also, because of the supply chain bottlenecks, have had shortages as goods have not been, or inputs have not been able to move uh, where they where they needed to be positioned. So, uh, for instance, I just read in the paper today that we have a shortage of of, of aluminum cans, uh, which is really impacting uh, beverage production. So it, it's really been a been a a, a a supply chain challenge for for uh, companies generally, but also in the zones. Although the zones, as I mentioned, have uh, provided some unique. Uh, um, resources to be able to deal with these supply chain problems. And of course, companies, as Ahmed mentioned, are, are moving to, to more toward uh, operating virtually um, and to the extent that they can. Obviously, when you've got production line workers or warehouse workers, you need bodies in those facilities. But, uh, but a lot of other um, uh, operations are occurring remotely. And, uh, and so companies in the zones are, have adjusted over the past few months uh, to, do, to, to accommodate this. And, um, and it's, you know, I'd say for the most part, it's working okay. Uh, it's not optimal, but, but, you know, goods are moving in and out of the zones now. And uh, hopefully that will be sustained and that we don't, enter into a new phase on the COVID infection that's really going to start slowing things down again. So um, I'll, I'll end with that, but, uh, um, you know, I'm happy to, uh, to expand if there are any other questions. It, it's quite interesting, uh, uh, Eric, how you tell us that the U.S. free zone are keeping the economy moving, adapting to a situation, and uh, keeping the market open for opportunities and acting as a key element in the, key in the supply chain. I would like to go to Gustavo now and uh, ask him, what are the main consequences of this pandemic for the Latin American free zones? Okay, after, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Jorge. Uh, I thank you for being you. It's, I am so glad to, to, uh, to be again here. And congratulations, because this is an amazing event. Uh, congratulations for you, Jorge, for uh, your entire team, Blanca, Pere Navarro. And of course, it's a pleasure for me to share this panel with my friends, Eric and Ahmed. We are always uh, working together for our free day songs. Uh, so, as you know, uh, Jorge, under our association, we have uh, many countries, 26 countries, uh, in not only in America, we have in two continents because it's Spain. Uh, is part of this association. So the evolution of this pandemic is different uh, on time and, and geographically, but I think uh, we have uh, for sure one point, one point in common. That's it. The COVID-19 has been the catalyst of uh, digitalization. Uh, we are working for a long time in our uh, special economic zones uh, to adapt us uh, to this new uh, industrial revolution 4.0, uh, this uh, digital economy. But right now, we need to adapt us um, quickly to, uh, to offer digital services, uh, digital process, digital, digital activities. Uh, you can think about, for example, uh, this uh, remote work, many labors, uh, from our companies inside our free zones, 
are working at home. So we need a digital uh, process to, to, to control this, this, uh, this fact. Or for example, uh, the e-commerce, we need to, uh, to do easier this process in e-commerce because we are the perfect platform to the free contact economy. So for me, this is the, the, the most important point. But in the other hand, also the global economy is changing. Uh, we have living for many years under the globalization, and maybe we we could uh, call it this period as a slowization, uh, decreasing FDI uh, trade. So uh, the pillars of globalization are changing. For example, uh, uh, from offshoring of multinational company to relocate and reshoring, or uh, from the global value chain to the regional value chain, in which the companies are look, uh, looking for uh, to be closer than uh, commodities and, and customers. So everything is changing, and uh, this is the new context in which our free uh, special economic zones uh, show we ahead. So uh, for me, I think the most important trend uh, right now is, it could be the convergence between special economic zones and science and technology parks. I think uh, it could be the, the, the key to attract uh, a foreign direct investment to our territory. And I think this is an, an example in which every of our special economic zones are, are working. I, I have been speaking about the smart zones, the, 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 the special economic zones that for digital services. Or for example, uh, Jorge, you, the Zona Franca Barcelona, uh, present uh, just this week the e-zone. I think this is the way because we need to offer these digital services in this new context, in this new age of the digital economy. Uh, and finally, as conclusion, uh, always I, 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 I prefer not to don't speak about the impact of this crisis in our special economic zone. I think uh, better is, is to say how our special economic zone have, have been helping to mitigate this crisis. We, are, we have been working to, to keep the economy alive, to, to give in the continuity of, of the global trade. And I think this is a, a, a really important role, not only during this crisis, uh, also, of course, after in the new, new age, the digital economy context, uh, uh, after this COVID-19. Your remarks, uh, Gustavo, are, are remarkable in the sense that the COVID pandemic basically helped to shift the focus of the economic zones, and it's acting like a, a catalysator to change the industry and making it more uh, dynamic and more e-friendly. But I would like to go back uh, to Eric, uh, because I have a very specific question. Uh, what, what do you see? What do you see in the near future are the main challenges uh, that economic zones are facing in the U.S. We know that this is a, uh, we all know that this is an, um, an electoral year. We have an election coming up. Uh, the president of the United States uh, got uh, infected by the COVID. So there's a lot of things that I would like to hear from you and from the U.S. perspective regarding these challenges for the economic zones. Well, I would say that our challenges are, are twofold. Um, Generally, the, the first, obviously, is how to manage uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, the second one is, uh, is the consequences of trade policy and the trade wars that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump has initiated uh, have really presented some considerable challenges for, um, for companies. We've seen a a significant increase in, in duties that are being assessed, and they're being assessed in a way in ways that are very, very unpredictable. These are the these are the tariffs that are uh, on on goods from China, but also from the European Union, Canada, many other countries on a wide range of products. Um, steel and aluminum uh, were hit early on. 
which had an impact throughout the supply chain. All manufacturers who use steel and aluminum in their in their manufacturing operations were impacted by those duties. Uh, China, of course, is a huge uh, trading partner with the United States, and to have essentially all trade with China subject to uh, significant uh, duties uh, really had a, a had a, a major impact. So we're dealing with the consequences of both the pandemic and the disruptions that it's created in supply chains and, and uh, uh, amplified by the administration's trade wars and trade policy, which have been designed to drive, uh, to, to reduce imports and to drive production back to the United States. That is really not panned out, I think, the way the, the president had expected. Um, the latest trade figures are that actually our merchandise trade deficit is at a record high right now, um, that we're importing much more then uh, the impact on imports has been much less than the impact on our exports. And as a result, our merchandise trade deficit has really uh, grown considerably. Um, and that in part also is due to uh, the strong dollar. The dollar right now is trading at a, at a very high level compared to other currencies. So all of that is driving a, 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 a massive uh, uh, trade deficit. But what all this is doing, as Gustavo mentioned, is, is having a very, very much of an impact on supply chains and um, and moving moving suppliers around. Uh, we have seen in bilateral trade with China a significant decrease, uh, but that trade is not moving back to the United States. It's moving to other countries, particularly in Asia, um, and uh, we are seeing reshoring. Uh, you know. One of the objectives of the uh, new U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement that replaced the NAFTA was to uh, bring production back to the United States. However, some of the rules of origin in that agreement, particularly in the auto sector, really lead to some skepticism that that's going to happen, that it's really made it very difficult, very complicated and expensive now to because of those rules of origin to set up production in the United States. But we really feel that the zone system can help mitigate those impacts. And for companies that are looking to, to uh, reshore production back in the United States, the foreign trade zone program really presents a, uh, a safe harbor to be able to do that. But we do have to resolve some, some outstanding issues related to the, to the Trump tariffs and how they are applied to zones. Um, we've had some real problems um, with, um, with unpredictability about how, how and when the duties apply to goods in a, in a zone. For instance, if you've got merchandise sitting in a zone and while it's there outside the customs territory, the duty is increased, decreased, or eliminated administratively what duty rate applies when the goods are then withdrawn from the zone. That has not been a clearly answered question, and it's something that we're actually having to try to uh, clarify through a legislative proposal. So um, we do, as Gustavo mentioned, think that the zones program really provides uh, a, a way to buffer some of these uh, uh, challenges that, that companies and the U.S. economy are facing. Uh, but that's not to say that we don't have our own challenges as a result of the trade policy and the shift and the shifts that we're seeing in supply chains moving toward more uh, more regional uh, supply chains and local supply chains. It, it's quite interesting what you're telling us about the legislative challenges that the uh, reasons are facing in the U.S., particular in this electoral year. We, we'll go back later on that point, but I'd like to switch to Ahmed now. Uh, Ahmed, uh, we we know each other. We are all members of the World Free Zone Organization. We met in several meetings uh, talking about the associations, the future of Free Zone Associations. How, how do you see the future of the Free Zones Associations globally? I mean, here we have the three major players of the Atlantic Free Zones Association. But how do you see it from your African perspective? It will be very interesting to know. 
I think that there is uh, no way without implementing uh, fruitful collaboration and cooperations between, uh, let's say, the representative of the continental uh, economic zones. And this goes by sharing, of course, different views, resources, uh, skills, applying intelligence and, and the strength to discuss great many issues, identifying areas of, of, of corporations and uh, accomplish objective and goals by coordinating and collaborating together. This should not be a wish, but a will. And uh, we are here not to share announcements or statement of good faith, but I think it's time to move forward and identify uh, concrete actions and maybe joint project initiatives uh, that could address issues of common interest. Uh, we would suggest, I would suggest maybe uh, five major actions that could be undertaken easily. First of all, connecting the economic leaders and expanding their network through, let's say, social media referencing, jo joint, pro joint promotion initiatives, and any activities that can connect the economic zones leaders to each other across the globe, not, uh, uh, across the world, not only at the continental level. We already do that in Africa, and it's time to, uh, let's say, expand it to, uh, let's say, the neighboring organizations or to, the, uh, to our partners. Second is uh, to improve the capacity building and expertise sharing through the setup of uh, joint training sessions, webinars, conferences, we have done this exercise before, but we should maybe duplicate it more and more. And uh, it's, I mean, we have definitely uh, many uh, topics that we could address jo jointly because at the end of the day, we are facing the same, the same problem and the same, uh, and the same challenges. Uh, the third action could be the setup of a knowledge collaborative framework that could lead to, uh, let's say, the, the, the realization of benchmark survey, assessment, analysis. And, uh, and this is very important uh, when you are making a benchmark uh, with, let's say, uh, and also learning from others' experience. The setup of this collaborative uh, fra fra framework could be very helpful to all of us. Uh, fourth actions could be designing, uh, let's say, a key performance indicators and, uh, let's say, a common standard to comply with. And this could take, on, uh, take into consideration, of course, the local context uh, or the continental uh, context, but this would at least harmonize somehow the way that we design, that we develop special economic zones and uh, by making uh, a list of specific requirements for that. And five, uh, the fifth actions could be uh, uh, advocating, lobbying with international institutions and this is all for the benefit of uh, the special economic zones uh, de development, uh, supporting its missions, and of course, uh, attending the com common objectives. So collaborations definitely build strong relationship. It uh, breaks down the wall between partners to make the most of our of mutual beneficial assets and uh, sh share, sharing, of course, uh, new opportunities of partnership, not only between the existing partners, which is the case already, we do have some ongoing uh, partnership with uh, with ASFA, uh, with uh, the World Free Zone organizations, but also uh, it's the opportunity to set up successful partnership with uh, new partners and also connecting uh, our economic zones. So, uh, if even even if uh, things don't work out the valuable lessons that we learn will always help us to do better next time for sure that's that's very interesting because you're talking about reinventing uh, certain parameters of an association that i think we all need to consider as as uh, global leaders as you need to consider as global leaders of the economic zones and i would like to go back to gustavo uh, talking about reinventing yourself i know that asfa uh, recently launched a new tool to facilitate trade among the Frasons, which is called, if I'm not mistaken, Relocate LATAM. I would like to, if you will be so kind to explain us what is this initiative about? I think, Gustavo, your microphone is off. Okay, yeah. thank you. We have you. Okay, uh, as you know, Jorge, um, we have the two main goals in our association uh, is 
uh, in order to defend our re regime and um, obviously to promote it. So, uh, 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 first of all, uh, to defend, to defend uh, our regime in our association, in this big family, as you know, as family, uh, as we, we, we like to, to call us, in this big family in which, uh, of course, I, I would like to, to work together to join with Africa or not, because we have a lot of uh, common goals in Atlantic area, of, of, and of course, uh, under umbrella of World Free Zone Organization, we, we are working and we join many actors, not only special economic zones, also uh, the companies, the governments. We are working together because we believe uh, our, our voice is stronger uh, all together. And we are working uh, in this moment, in this period, to push, to change the regulation about many of the actual, uh, currently uh, nor normative, legal, uh, legal uh, uh, procedures, not only in our countries, in our government, also uh, by multilateral uh, institutions. So I think this is a really important moment to, to work together, as Ahmed uh, said, it's so, so important for sure to defend and push the changes, the necessary changes in the re re regulation. Um, in the order of, of promote of our regime, uh, as you say, uh, Jorge, uh, this is a period to reinvent us. Uh, we are uh, living days in which UNTAD uh, says about uh, a decrease in FDI between 30 or 40 percent this year. For example, the World Trade Organization uh, speaks about in 2020 the go down the trade, the global trade, in 30 percent. So we are uh, talking about less investment, less trade, more competition. So this is the moment to change, and I think this is most important, not only the less trade in this period. Uh, maybe it's more important to know the changes in this, in this trade. For example, for sure, in the next period, um, will be new markets, new markets uh, under a new geopolitical context. Uh, also, new sectors, digital sectors uh, uh, mainly. And finally, new new tools for trading. Uh, we have been spoken about e-commerce, for example, printing on demand. And finally, the most important thing in this moment is the new commercial and marketing tools, digital tools. Uh, the, this, this is living a, a period in which uh, the, the companies uh, are uh, looking for new, new location these regional uh, value chains, and this is the moment to show our offert of our free zones. And this is point in which, uh, as you say, we, we are, uh, we are uh, develop a, a special platform, a web page, in five languages, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese, in which, uh, in order to promote the available warehouse, offices, and uh, scopes in every our uh, free trade zones in the region. In this moment in which it's not possible to visit, uh, uh, presentially visit the, of the investors, we have to show by the net, by a platform web, every our available spaces. And in this, in this web, relocate Latin, you said it before, relocate Latin. <laughs> I want to say it many times for for remember every investors. Uh, the investor can can uh, find uh, uh, categorized by the the use for industrial services, logistic. Also, uh, it is is for rent or for sale. The number of square meters, every characteristic. So this is the, oppor the opportunity to show to the investors everything we, we, we can offer just in this important moment uh, when in, in their mind is the, the new location. And this is only possible right now by the internet. 
a digital tools. So it's for that uh, we are so, so happy, so glad for the, our uh, association, our uh, Camila Moreno, our uh, general director, uh, our team, because this work uh, has done in, in, in only two months, just when we need this, this platform. So I think this is the, the biggest marketing strategy that will be de developed in, in our association. And this is the, the moment to show to the world uh, what, what can, can, can offer. Uh, as you know, Jorge and, and, and partners, if you are not in internet, in the cloud, you don't exist. So this is the moment to, to improve these digital uh, tools. This is a very interesting uh, approach, Gustavo, and I think it will be an amazing opportunity if in the near future we can have a relocate LATAM, relocate Africa, even relocate US, you know, or even relocate Atlantic website, you know, because there is a lot of need from the people to know the availability of lands and offices, and the investors are looking for it. So this is an amazing, amazing initiative from your side. But I would like to go now to Eric, because we were talking about associations, we were talking about strengthening and working together on this new initiative uh, that Gustavo just mentioned, but there is some main difference between the trade associations in the U.S. and the trade associations outside the U.S. So I would like, Eric, if you could explain this uh, to all the, our audience a little bit more, that will be great. Yeah, thanks, Jorge. Um, there are some important differences the way trade associations work in the United States uh, compared to uh, many other countries. I often, you know, receive delegations from zones uh, in other countries, and uh, and a lot of the conversation focuses around we'd like NAFTC to help us develop, uh, you know, economic uh, ties with uh, with zones in the United States and sign contracts and you know. Uh, uh, and, and build business and so forth. And that's not really what we as an association do and typically trade associations in the United States do. Um, in that sense, our, our role is really uh, fourfold. We, we represent uh, the stakeholders, the community of stakeholders in the zone program, the public and private uh, entities, the grantees, operator, users, and service providers. So. We, we provide the, vo the collective voice for those stakeholders, um, uh, both domestically and abroad. Uh, advocacy is our second uh, uh, key uh, role. We are lobbyists for the FTZ program on, uh, on public policy issues impacting the program and the stakeholders. Uh, we are also a forum for education on the FTC program's value as a tool for expanding economic development, competitiveness, employment, investment, and global supply and value chains. And we are uh, a forum for developing best practices. And uh, so we really do not get involved in any way in the business decisions of our stakeholders. Uh, they, they uh, and that includes applying for um, uh, is both zone status and the authority to operate in the zone. We generally don't get involved in those decisions, um, that, that those applications are made to the U.S. government. And uh, as I said, we also do not get involved in their, in their business decisions really at all. And I think that that is an important difference and it's a bit of a misperception about the role of both NAFTZ and um, and trade associations in the U.S. generally. But as a representative, as the collective voice of the Foreign Trade Zone program, it does provide us the ability to build uh, uh, relationships with other associations. Um, and uh, just, just to expand on Ahmed's points earlier, you know, I, I see that there are really three areas in which uh, there are great opportunities that we've been working on to to uh, develop relationships with with uh, associations and zones uh, outside the United States, and those are um, economic uh, and uh, best practices, and also benefits. Um, you know, we we have um, 
on, on the on the economic side, um, you know, we can uh, help facilitate discussions, although we don't inv get involved in decisions. We can facilitate uh, discussions and 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 programs and analyses on how the global zone system can be leveraged to help companies uh, operate uh, more effectively and um, and more efficiently. So uh, I think that developing relationships among zones uh, from our perspective is valuable for that. And we do have cooperation agreements, for instance, with ASFA and with the Barcelona Free Zone. And we are looking to build, uh, expand those, those collaborative um, uh, relationships. Um, turning to best practices, uh, you know, we have really been a, 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 a very active in, in these discussions, um, both in the United States and globally. For instance, the OECD uh, initiative on illicit trade. We've worked with the uh, WFCO and, um, and other zone, zones throughout the world. On, uh, on that initiative to, to ensure that zones do not become a conduit for illicit trade. We're seeing um, you know, a, a big focus on that, not only uh, uh, globally, but also in the United States. As you know, there's, there's been a lot of concern, for instance, about the forced labor situation in Xinjiang and China. So um, uh, we, we believe that uh, that our long experience as a zones program and our, our emphasis on compliance and enforcement really provide, uh, help us uh, be a resource for developing best practices globally. At the same time, you know, the WFCO is working very diligently on, on these issues and we feel that they really provide a great resource to be able to uh, coalesce the global industry into um, uh, developing uh, a very robust set of best practices. And finally, on benefits, as I mentioned, um, our zone program is really focused on duty benefits. Other uh, zone systems have additional benefits to really um, um, attract foreign direct investment and jobs into their zone system. And so we're very interested to see what, what other zone programs are doing successfully to develop um, the sort of incentives that really help drive and build uh, the uh, zone system in their country, then whether that might provide uh, some, some useful models for us in our own country. Thank you very much, Eric. I, I just want to tell you, the, our distinguished panelists, that we have, I was briefed just now, and um, you are being seen in 32 countries in Africa, Europe, and Latin America, and of course in the US. So I, it's, I mean, the ratings are super high. I'm very happy to have you here to be part of this panel with you today. It's been an amazing, amazing opportunity. And I hope that this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship, just to paraphrase Casablanca movie. Uh, and I really hope that we will meet again, maybe in Casablanca or maybe here in Barcelona or hopefully, uh, or also in, in Washington in the near future after all this pandemic the madness is over, uh, but thank you, thank you very much. It's been amazing to have you here, and I hope that we will be able to meet soon again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed, Eric, Gustavo, for your participation here in Vinu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Y it's a pleasure. A pleasure. Y muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Merci. Shukran. Pajasta. Pajasta. Muchísimas gracias por, por tu intervención. Y ha sido un placer eh, colaborar con tu equipo. Muchísimas Muchas gracias. gracias a ti, Ana. Gracias a todos vosotros, asistentes. Ahora vamos a pasar, después de la publicidad, con una conexión a Estación de Francia, donde tendrá lugar una inspirational talk a cargo de Marian Rojas. Marian Rojas que hablará sobre Understanding the Brain of the, of the 21st Century. Vamos a entender un poco cómo ha cambiado nuestro cerebro. Hasta ahora. <música>